So this is me. My name is Thomas Southall. Um, I'm a product designer. I also call myself a UX designer as well. Um, I'm a product designer at Evenness. You can use he, him with me, and I'm a Chicago land native. A little bit about me is I'm a former language educator. Um, my interests are illustrating and 3D modeling and also reading. And as you can hear, you can see my LinkedIn link. You are more than welcome to connect. Hey, everybody. I'm Shay. My pronouns are they, them. And I am currently working as product manager at Evenness. I wear a lot of different hats in my work life, though. I have had experience in the defense industry, in the tech industry, in fintech. Uh, but really, my specialties are process improvement and enhancement, and really love focusing that effort towards accessibility and inclusion. I have a master's in information systems management from Loyola and a bachelor's in supply chain management from Arizona State. Outside of my work life, I, I love rock climbing, cycling, gaming. Uh, fortunately, I live in Los Angeles, so I can do those things pretty much all year round. But I have also included my LinkedIn here as well. So please feel free to connect and reach out. Happy to chat with anybody about any questions or just even to have more networking opportunities. What is sustainability? What is that? What is that? Uh, what does sustainability mean for technology and what does it mean for designers in the tech field? So here are some traditional definitions you probably have seen before about sustainability. Sustainability is the ability to be to maintain a process over time. Um, you'll see this in certain contexts for environmental, for example, like reducing pollution. Uh, in the social context for human rights and developing communities, uh, the economic uh, sustainability which is a capacity to maintain an economic system. Uh, cultural sustainability is preserving cultural beliefs or traditions protected from uh, globalization. And then sustainability for political, uh, in the political context is upholding justice and then e equitable uh, distribution of resources. Those are some definitions we've seen, we've, you've probably seen before, but what does sustainability mean for technology? Um, I'm going to refer to what Microsoft says about environmental sustainability within the context of technology. So for them, uh, environmental sustainability is the ability to maintain ecological balance between uh, our planet and natural environment and to conserve natural resources to support the well-being of current and future generations. Uh, sustainability uh, in terms of technology is a mix of perspectives. So I'll be going over three pillars of sustainability. The first one is socials. In a tech space, in a tech environment, um, that is a workplace and for, for many of us. So when I talk about social sustainability, that talks about important uh, office dynamics, like employee issues like health and safety, making sure that the people who work there feel empowered, feel like they can really develop within the company and have also a work-life balance. Um, if any of those uh, sustainability practices are not respected, uh, you that most likely that will result in people leaving the company. Next one is economic sustainability. Modern age tech uh, is talking about businesses first and foremost. So for businesses, this sustainability is, uh, is what about making sure the revenue coming in uh, balances with a long-term business growth that the company may have as well. The last one of the sustainability for technology is the environmental sustainability. So this one talks about uh, steps to enhance the company's efficiencies to reduce consumption and waste and to measure uh, monitor carbon emissions across the supply chain you may, may take part in already. So now we have this idea of sustainability in uh, a, a more focused technological sense. So what does this mean for UX design, user experience design, and design principles, which is an effective tool and the guideline I use for my work? So user experience designers are responsible for the innovation at the structural and visual level of a digital product. Designers work hand in hand with researchers often to conduct testing, to use data, for example, qualitative or quantitative, to verify if past design choices in a digital product is working or to test out potential possibilities for a, for a digital product like a web app or a mobile app and using, basically using numbers to verify if that would be a good choice. But first and fundamentally, 
one of the reasons why I enjoy being a user experience designer is because it's our responsibility to understand the user's needs and wants and then acting on those wants. Uh, in terms of helping us act on those wants from the users, um, there's a couple of tool sets, things to keep in mind and guidelines I use to make sure that we check all the bases off to make sure that users are first and foremost centered in every digital product they interact with. So these are design principles, which are foundational guidelines for design um, that incorporate user needs. And fundamental principle of good design is user centricity, consistency, visual consistency throughout a uh, digital product, visual hierarchy, for example, button sizes and appearances of text weight compared to header text and body text. There's context as well. Um, there's also user control. So when we're making a digital product, we have to think about how much is a user able to fix on their own if they make an, if they make an error on a web page. Accessibility, well, this is definitely a very important principle. We will be uh, delving in a little bit more in this presentation, but basically it's inclusive design for all. Why would you want to block people out of your uh, potential audience just for... Uh, just for any disability or uh, accessibility issues they may have. So there's a way around that. And the last one is usability, efficiency, and memorability. We're talking about a learnability. So here are some design principles for sustainability as well. We have circularity, product efficiency, longevity, and effective use. We have something called dematerialization, next best material selection, and then green supply chain. This is just a list of the design principles for sustainability. And the ones you see here that are underlined, I will delve in a little bit more to elaborate. So we have dematerialization. So dematerialization is what is currently happening in the, in the technological space. So it is the, generally speaking, it's a design principle that talks about the switch between analog and digital. So this, is, this uh, principle calls, into, uh, calls attention to the fact that for now, a lot of uh, a lot of products out there do are not um, physical products. So therefore, if we want to add features to any to a mobile app or a web app, things like that do not increase increase weight of production. There is there's less uh, updating time because there's that no there's less of a distance between physical selves and um, the digital products we use. So basically, this is all about leveraging digitization at every step. This um, also talks about uh, making sure moving from analog to digital uh, does conserve resources. The next one is product efficiency. So this, um, this, this briefly talks about making sure that products use less energy. And when I'm talking about G, I'm, I'm also talking about things like what your phone is powered by electricity, power, but I'm also talking about the energy of people's attention and also people's uh, tolerance to experience a for example, a web app or a mobile app that is infuriating or perhaps takes too long to load. Types of things, loading times, things that make a user, once they approach a website, it makes them hard to navigate it. These are all efficient. The last one we have is for design principles uh, is longevity. So a part of longevity is the opposite of planned obsolescence. So allowing your product to be upgradable and making your products built to last. So the first point there, uh, technology and web apps and mobile apps, um, it's very easy to upgrade them, very modular. So basically we wanna make sure that is all uh, inclusive and accessible as well. Products with longevity, um, this is a design principle for UX designers because this longevity can create our customers and a good brand reputation. So what is digital accessibility? Uh, I'm sure a lot of us have seen the term A11Y or Ally. Some people like to pronounce it that way uh, or A11Y. It's all about designing and building products that, that regardless of a person's disability or abilities, they can still enter in a meaningful and equivalent way. And those are really key terms, meaningful and equivalent. Your user should never have to have a, a simplified or watered down version of the content just because they have a disability. Uh, they should always be able to acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, and, and enjoy the same services as folks who do not have disabilities. So why is it important? Well, the first one, kind of the boring one, but we all have to admit it, 
it's legally required. That by no means should be your baseline for incorporating accessibility. It is a legal requirement, but also it affects more people than you know. Um, there's an estimated 16% of the world's population that experiences a significant disability, um, and that was studied by the World Health Organization. Um, there's also about 15 to 20% of, of the world's population that exhibits some form of neurodivergence. So I think neurodivergence, meaning folks who uh, have ADHD or are on the autism spectrum, they, they process information differently, brain functions differently, which means that content must be tailored for them as well. Other thing to consider, there's a high level of intersectionality with other marginalized com communities in folks who are neurodivergent, like gender diversity, LGBTQIA. I personally am an example of this. I am non-binary, I'm queer and autistic. So I fit into that, that um, statistic there pretty well. The other reason that things are important is as digital products continue you to expand their reach and impact on the world. It's our responsibility as creators to ensure that everyone has access to the tools and benefits that these products provide. We're all seeing it now. There's huge growth in AI. There's huge growth in digital products. And more and more of our daily lives are going to be dependent on technology. We really don't want to exclude anybody from that. We want to make sure everybody can access the benefits of technology at the same level. In this slide, which I believe you all will have access to or a recording of, um, I have linked the web content accessibility guidelines there. Those are so thorough for you guys. You can reference them at any time. They provide checklists and everything that you need to see as far as different levels of requirements. 100% required versus nice to have. So I would follow that link. It's definitely very helpful. These are the, the four main needs that folks might deal with. But again, this, remember, this is just very, very high level. There's a lot of intersectionality and a lot of other things that folks might need. But the main ones, vision, hearing, motor skills, and cognitive. So vision, uh, it doesn't always necessarily mean somebody who is blind. It could be somebody who has low vision. They could have light sensitivity. They could have color blindness. So there's a lot of things to think about here. And then hearing, again, doesn't necessarily mean somebody who's deaf. Could be also like for myself specifically, I have um, hearing sensitivity. So when noises are too high pitched or too loud, it's actually very hard for me to process information. And I know that that applies to a lot of folks who have neurodivergence. Motor skills, not necessarily just somebody who maybe is in a wheelchair or doesn't have the use of their hands. It could also be limited use, um, like folks who have arthritis. It's harder for them to navigate with a mouse. Or, or um, my, my dad, for example, has Parkinson's disease. It's really hard for him to select a very small radio button because his hand tremors a little bit. So thinking about these types of users and, you know, make the radio buttons more spaced out, make things easier to navigate with the keyboard. And then cognitive, again, is that if you think about neurodivergence, folks who maybe have sensory processing disorders, multitasking difficulty, memory issues, there's a lot of things to consider. It's a very, very wide spectrum of things, but I like this graphic that shows kind of the high level. Directly from those web content accessibility guidelines that I have linked in the previous slides, there are four main principles when you're thinking about web accessibility, and they spell out the acronym POOR. So those four are perceivable, so the content must be available to users via sight, hearing, and or touch, operable, Product must be accessible or keyboard accessible, navigable, and compatible with different input methods. If your users need to plug in whatever accessibility tool they have, they should be able to still navigate your content. Uh, understandable and robust. So these are the four main principles. Like I said before, they are really detailed out on the uh, web, web content accessibility guidelines. Okay, so perceivable. Content must be available to users 
via sight, hearing, touch, et cetera. So I think there's four main guidelines within Perceivable. Text alternatives. So if you think about your users who are seeing or vision impaired, uh, they're more than likely using a screen reader. So when you have non-text media or images, you want to make sure that each of those are labeled with alt text so that when the screen reader gets to that element, it at least describes to the user what is showing on the screen. A big mistake that a lot of people use is not providing a text for images. And then when the screen reader gets to it, it'll just read the title of the image, which is usually some really long nonsensical URL. Um, and that really inhibits the user's experience it's to see the image and then someone just hears a long link, not fun. So make sure all of your non-text content and elements have a text alternative. Time-based media. So if you have a little video clip or an audio clip, make sure that that is able to be paused or hidden or also have a text equivalent, even just an audio description at the bottom to say what the audio clip is explaining. For folks who can't hear it, it'll be nice for them to actually be able to say like, oh, the audio cl clip is explaining X, Y, Z. Um, the next adaptable. So if you think about folks who maybe need different types of screens or orientation, if I needed to flip my screen into landscape mode instead of portrait, content shouldn't be altered in any way. And also the screen reader, those will read content in the order in which the, it is programmed. So you want to make sure that your content flow is exactly as you want it to be displayed. So that way the screen reader, if the going through the page, it doesn't switch the uh, order in which things are meant to be. All users should be able to be on different devices and have the content accessible regardless. All right, and then distinguishable. Big thing on like contrast ratios. I'm guessing a lot of us have heard about that, but um, for the very basic, most required level, text contrast ratio needs to be four and a half to one. For AAA, making sure that you're really going above and beyond, you want to have it to be seven to one, which means that like the user can distinguish the color from the background more easily. So for example, these lines, the background color is a dark gray slash black, and the text is white. If Thomas and I had used a more gray or darker text, it would be really difficult for everybody to see this, right? Uh, distinguishable, another important feature here. So that, sum, that sums up the perceivable requirements. Move on to the operable ones. Operable, as we mentioned, the product must be accessible through various input methods. So think about keyboard use. Folks who can't use a mouse or it's easier for them to navigate on the keyboard, you want to make sure that all functionality that's available through clicking and pointing is also available through the keyboard. And one kind of pitfall, this a lot of times folks forget about keyboard traps in navigation. Users can click the back button or refresh if they get stuck in a random spot on a web page. But when you're just using the keyboard, you also need to have those capabilities as well. So if you have, let's say, a video in your on your web page or in your product, uh, make it adjustable. Allow the user to actually pause or rewind. Having that capability gives folks time that they need to process the content in their own way. Definitely a big thing to be aware of for seizures and physical reactions. If you have any sort of animations on your in your product or on your web page, there is a threshold of three flashes per second. Uh, anything at that point or higher is a risk for folks who may have seizures or physical reactions to animation. So definitely avoid having anything that flashes more than three times per second, and also allow your users to disable the animations because even if it's not going to trigger a seizure or something as severe as that, it might still be distracting or difficult for them to process the content with animation. 
you want to provide as many ways to your or, or ways to help your user as possible. You know, breadcrumbs, consistent titles and headings, focusable components. So an example of that, if you think um, when a user goes to click a button, when they hover over the button, you can have a visual display of focus, either outlining it or highlighting it. Um, there's a lot of options, but making it clear what the user is doing and um, making it easy for them to figure out what's expected to do next. And then finally, input, input modalities. Um, so this is making it operable for folks who use screen readers, speech to text. You know, if I have to fill out a form and maybe I don't type, make it available or make your product compatible with a speech to text. So for understandable, you've got readable, predictable, and input assistance. Making the text readable, that can be visually, that can also be if you want to go above and beyond triple, AAA status, even having an option or a tool available for users to um, understand the pronunciation, translate it into a different language. Some content, you know, it maybe needs to be translated for folks who English is not their first language or whatever your content language is. Um, predictable, so kind of like I mentioned before, you want the user to understand what is expected of them and know like, hey, if I'm going to want to go to the next screen or if I want to perform a certain action, it should be clear and predictable how to accomplish that. And then input assistance, you're having a user fill out a form you want to make it very clear how they can fill out that form. And if there are any errors, be specific in explaining what the error is. So I have one example. Um, I used to work a lot with Salesforce. And um, anytime we had to fill out a form in Salesforce and it would error out, it would just pop up and say, oh, you have an error with XYZ but it would never highlight which field was actually the problem. So if you have forms that have a large number of fields and you tell a user, oh, one of those is wrong, you don't want them to have to go back and figure out which field it is. You want to highlight the field, auto-navigate to it, whatever you can do to make it easier for the user to understand what the mistake was and actually provide the input that is required. All right, and then so for our robust principle, it's compatible. So for a product to be robust, it needs to be able to grow and be compatible with the assistive technology market is huge. There's a lot of applications out there and there's a lot of different tools. You wanna make sure you're staying on top of that research and seeing what users are actually finding helpful and make sure that your product is compatible with those technologies. So best practices to help make sure that you're incorporating accessibility. So one, accessibility is actually a mindset that should be embraced in the company culture. That is in a perfect world. I know that the, a lot of organizations at this point are really just trying to check that compliance box. You know, like I said before, the one legal requirement aspect. But I really encourage everybody, if you've got a platform, try to advocate for your organization to have accessibility be part of the culture. And it should honestly be thought about as high up as the UX design phase at the very least. As I mentioned before, stay on top of research of the latest accessibility tools and how they operate. You know, try them out for yourself. Uh, see how a screen reader performs with your web page. See how, you know, using the keyboard navigation works. Trying out these tools for yourself will give you an idea of what it's actually like to, to rely on them and how they function for you. There is a whole slew of A11Y testing tools that are available. Um, some of them are paid, some of them are free. I do understand that a lot of organizations are very picky about what tools they purchase and how they incorporate that. So. If it's available in your workspace, if you can advocate for your workspace to purchase one, these tools are really great and they make it super easy to just run a quick test on an environment. 
Uh, I've also included a link to uh, the QA Leads 23 Best Web Accessibility Tools, just if you guys want to check those out. Another thing, incorporate accessibility checklists into your standard test scripts. If you guys don't have access to testing tools and automated features, make sure that your test scripts have checklists to go through it at the very lots of resources um, that you can incorporate. And also, if, you're, if your organization doesn't have standardized test scripts, I would definitely advocate for that just to make sure that you have that consistency across the board. Ensure user personas include folks with disabilities. This is huge. Advocate for the real voices too. So if you are part of your product research team or have access to connect with them, advocate that they go out and actually collect surveys from folks with disabilities because it's really important to make sure that people who are actually having these experiences are the ones providing their insights. Don't really want to speak for somebody that doesn't already have a big enough voice as it is. And then lastly, provide users with choice. Whenever in doubt, just add, try to add the option. Make it as simple as you can, whether it's like allowing a user to turn dark mode on or uh, pause an animation or hide an animation. If you're not sure what the best design practice is, just provide a choice. That's a big, big empowerment to folks um, to just even be able to toggle on and off and be like, wow, somebody considered this for me. And that feels great. This, like I said, this was all really high level. There are so many resources for accessibility. And honestly, there's no one right way to do it too. I think the beautiful thing about this is that we're going to be able to creatively come up with different solutions to help people continue to get better and better the more that we think about it. We are going to jump into some review next. And uh, speaking of providing users with a choice, we're going to kind of do the review as like a, or this or that sort of trivia. So we're going to provide you guys with some choices and, and see what you think based on information that you received today. So I'll hand it off to Thomas for that. So I just want, before we continue on to review, um, so I just want to address some points on how we can just be specific on what can we use about sustainability, about accessibility, and apply that in the metaverse. Now the metaverse is a little bit, is, um, and many parts of it are trying to replicate uh, real life uh, tangible objects and experiences. But as we remember from our uh, design principles, we can afford to uh, we can afford to add more features. Basically, we have a little bit of physical world, and then we have digital world, and there's so much we can leverage in order to make the best user experience for, for everyone. So, just uh, some things I want to call out: if you are in a situation where you have to make your own metaverse, and what you have to keep in mind to make sure those things are inclusive for them as well. So for example, uh, I would recommend uh, colorblindness toggle, for example, giving the users the ability to uh, change the color fonts and themes that they see in the world of the metaverse they're currently in. In terms of accessibility, fonts that include things, people with dyslexia, uh, dyslexia, as well as those who are neuro neurodivergent. And then the last thing, which is more of a social sustainability part, but and it's equally as important as all the rest. As you can see right now, Shay and I are we are communicating to you guys through a avatar. And, and as you can see, those avatars are pretty diverse, but we have to make sure for metaverse, you are given one of these avatars. We have to make sure that the the, the avatar is uh, diverse, making sure that it includes different varieties of body sizes body types, heights, gender expressions, and also ethnicities. Um, those little decisions, as Shay mentioned, all those little tiny choices expressed to users, just how included they are. We don't want any insinu insinuation through design that they, aren't in, that they aren't included in our enterprise. So I just wanted to, uh, just to call attention to how this all relates to the metaverse. So moving on, so what we have right here in terms of review, I'm showing you an example right now about color contrast. So colors are an effective way to communicate important ideas. Um, as, you, as you know, not everyone perceives in the same way. Colors 
and out color blindness, how it's represented between uh, different types of people. And again, uh, going back to the idea of if there's people he, if there's people out there who have obstacles in their way in terms of experiencing your, your digital product or uh, web experience, uh, there's ways that we have to we have to make sure that they are accounted for. Why would we exclude an audience arbitrarily? So uh, as you can see on the right hand side right here, we have an example of how color can be used to label and inform, for example, on a, a spreadsheet or just in, in general. So on the top, in the top example, you could see assignments, what I did this summer, my favorite movie, my favorite animal. Um, and you can see there, they, they incorporate colors. But the thing is, we don't know what those colors signify yet. And if this, and if that column was given to a colorblind person, they would even have less to work with in terms of deciphering what that even means. So below, Below that, you can see a different two columns, one that has assignment, the other that says status. That is a little extra step that can help inform, for example, some quick, read, quick reading for the color coding to make for good scanning. But also for people who, have, uh, who may be colorblind or so, this adds an extra, um, an extra like leverage they can use so they can understand what the colors mean, what the different shades mean. Um, in order to uh, communicate effectively. I'm gonna give you guys a couple moments, but large text, in terms of how text works with color contrast, large text needs a three to one ratio according to the uh, in accessibility standards. So as you can see right here, we have three buttons. So from the left to the right, only some of these succeed or fail in optimal accessibility. So I wanna take you, I want you guys to take a moment or two to think about which of these buttons fail, which of these buttons succeed? So basically, as you can see right here, the far left button is the one as AAA, so it's very successful. It's a high ratio as well, as you can see the numbers below that. But what really sticks out is that the whiteness of the text behind a very dark, like a dark deep orange or brown, that is the, that is the correct color contrast. So I can see that button from almost any size and be able to decipher that. However, for the middle button and the right button, those two are working with lighter, lighter colors of orange behind a white text background. I mean, a white text as well. And if you can see it on the far right one, text even looks a little, a little thinner. So we know that if we were to look at this on a phone or a desktop, um, those would catch the eye less in terms of uh, readability and understanding what that button does for the user. Next one is text weight for headers. So this is something that also works in many spaces as well. So basically on the left, but on the left box, you can see a, a header, uh, a header uh, structure for a website. And on the right, you can see a web page that uses headers from the left in a certain way. So my question here is on the on the right hand box. Are these correctly used or incorrectly used headings for your web page or mobile app? I'll give you a second to think about that. So for those who thought this was correct, you are correct. As you can see right here on the right hand side, these are correctly distributed heading weight, text weights for headers. So as you can see, heading two, is a one for one for, as you can see, cats on the top right there. Below that, you see heading three. So cats with spots is another use as well. And as you can see, uh, there is a uniformity and uh, a uniformity to everything. This, so we have the same heading on the left, but on the right side, we have a, a different, a different uh, distribution of headers. Is this correct or incorrect? already. So this one is actually incorrect. If anyone with a guess, the reason is, is that because all the headers, as you can see right here, they are not, um, they are distributed all over the place. There's less uniformity. So for example, heading four is used for the first one and then the sec and then the third title. But then for some reason, heading five is used for cats with spots and dogs with spots. When exact, when in reality, um, those headers should be just could be uh, designated to heading one, two, or three mostly. So it's all over the place.
Um, so the screen, if you if your users use a screen reader, the those will actually go in order of this format on the left on the standard format. So if you have content that's not following this hierarchy, uh, a screen reader will kind of spit it out all at once. It'll be a little bit jumbled. So making sure that your uh, content has this hierarchy, not even just for visual accessibility, but also for folks who use a screen reader, it follows good content flow. So uh, I just wanted to call out a couple really simple examples that I honestly see a lot of, I see a lot of both. So I, for form labels, I'm sure that we've all gone to fill out a form and we've seen both of these, right? Um, both of them say what we're supposed to input, with, the date of birth. Both of them give us the format, but can I want to give everybody just a minute to think about you know, which one of these is more accessible and why that might be. I can also just explain, but I'll give you guys a minute to think about it. All right. So I think honestly, what I see most often is the one on the left. And the reason that this is actually not the most accessible option is because when the user goes to provide their input, and they click in that input field, the formatting goes away. So for folks who maybe have memory recall issues or uh, um, aren't able to multitask as well, or are using, are not able to see option for them, as soon as that goes in there, the format, or as soon as they click in the field, the format goes away. So the, the option on the right is really the more accessible version because the format that's needed for this field is actually put in the label itself. So the screen reader will read the label with that format and the user will be able to see it even once they click into the input field. It's a lot better to make sure that if you're asking for input from your user, put the format in the field label itself. So that way it's visible and audible throughout the entire process. Uh, links. When we're talking about perceivable content, we want we say like we want the user to be able to understand what's expected, understand where they're going. Um, and again, this is something I see a lot of in both ways. So let me think about which is more accessible. Which one do you feel helps the user navigate more easily? So some people might think the option on the right because the word here is highlighted, so it's really telling the user where to click. But that's a really common mistake. For folks who are using screen readers, the word here doesn't really describe to them what the link is. Even though it seems more directive and it seems like it's helping guide the user more, the option on the right is really not accessible. You want to make sure that when you are linking something, that but text you are linking is clear and helps the user understand what they're going to follow because that that is also what screen readers are going to read back to the user. You want to say, okay, rather than click here, have your website linked saying my website. It describes what it is. It will read it. And it's with the blue underline, like we always see in a link, it's clear that that's what that is. Um, really making the amplified and understandable key. Yeah, thank you, everyone.